So now something we need to talk about that I think may be somewhat analogous to Israel, but I'm not sure, is food politics. And that's really um, what's causing a lot of these problems. And uh, this is the Supreme Court in the United States. No. <laughs> so if you look, and this is where food politics come, because this doesn't make sense. Fresh food, the cost is going up, 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 up. And the food, such as beer, butter, and soda, is going down, 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 down. It doesn't make sense. Because the foods that are most unhealthy, that are caused, you call these chronic diseases, are so expensive. Why are they so expensive? And why are the foods that we know are causing chronic diseases, that are causing kids to probably be the first generation that will not live as long as their parents, why are they cheap? Why would the government support such a policy? <coughs> and that all has to do with politics. It has to all do with lobbying of big business. And that's why the first few slides I showed you hold true. It's because it's all about politics in the states. And if you look at the top sources of calories, where are we getting most of our calories from? It's from foods like pizza, sweetened drinks, fried chicken, fried foods, <laughs> bread, simple flat, uh, white flour and stuff, and cookies, cakes, and all of that. That's where we're getting most of our calories from. All of these foods are subsidized by the government. It is very cheap to buy these foods. I'm going to pick on sugar a little bit because it's so important. I think here, too, so much sugar is added to foods and all the sweetened beverages you guys drink. So sugar added, it doesn't matter the source. It doesn't matter if it's brown sugar, if it's honey, if it's agave, I don't care. Sugar is sugar. And it is not natural for us to have sugar outside the context of a food. So sugar in fruit, there's no, it's not a problem because you have fiber and you have all those micronutrients and you have water and all these other things. It's when we extract the sugar and we add it that becomes a huge problem. And now we know much more about sugar than we did. Ten years ago, I wouldn't have been telling you this. But now we know that we probably have given too much attention to fat, although fat is, is very unhealthy animal fat, and probably not enough to white sugar and all the added sugars, which are probably causing a lot of the heart disease, stroke, and all these other things, of course, dental decay. So we should have no more. This is not a goal. If you're going to have added sugar, which, of course, we all enjoy a little bit, why not? No more than 10 teaspoons a day. And uh, so a teaspoon is 4 grams. <coughs> you find it easier to use grams. No more. That's not a goal. You have less. So look how much is in some typical products. If you have three sodas a day, you're getting like 30, over 30, 30 grams of tea of sugar, just from the soda. And how about those huge thin cups? Ketchup, one tablespoon has one and a half teaspoons of sugar, one tablespoon. What are you putting ketchup on? French fries. So you can see that so many foods, and we call this hidden sugars. And this was a big campaign that was on the subways. It was in New York City. I kind of want to show you and demonstrate a few slides of nutrition in action and politics in action. We've known for so long that sugar is probably one of the worst things you could add to your diet, too much of it. And the worst is in the form of liquids. It's called liquid candy. It's called liquid calories. I don't care if it's chocolate milk. I don't care if it's uh, Coca-Cola. It's probably the worst thing because most of the sugars, uh, chocolate, if it's in the chocolate milk, if at least there's some milk. But in general, it doesn't fill you up and it, it does other havoc to your body. So the whole idea was a lot of people don't realize when they drink that it adds to calories. I have a lot of patients, they don't even bother telling me what they drink anymore. They don't make the connection, alcohol. So they were show, trying to do this because they really wanted to limit the size of beverages in New York City because people are drinking huge sodas because McDonald's and, uh, and all these other fast food have, have re uh, free refills, and that the bigger it is, the cheaper it is. So um, we realized that the population that was suffering most were the people who were the poorest because they are in an environment where there's so much fast food and they're exposed to all these foods. So what the mayor Bloomberg tried to do was to 
limit the portion of a beverage. It doesn't mean you can have 20 of them, but one portion should be no more than 16 ounces, which is very generous. That's twice the amount that anyone should have, and I don't think people should be drinking soda unless once in a while. Um, and what he tried to do was to reduce the health care costs because there's such a link between soda and uh, uh, obesity. Well, let me tell you something. The soft drink industry has a huge lobbying, and they have billions of dollars. And this is what you witnessed politics in action in Manhattan. It, it's unbelievable what you saw. They had these fake committees tell people that you're, it's becoming a nanny state. They had all these trucks that said, don't let bureaucrats tell you what size beverage to buy. They had Big Apple or Big Brother. It was unbelievable the amount of money that this beverage industry spent because they were afraid, mm -hmm. because they were afraid that you know, people may buy less soda because all they care about is profits. So what did Coca-Cola do? Coca-Cola decided, by the way, Coca-Cola is suffering very much, thank goodness. Their, their <laughs> stocks have gone down 30%. That's good. In the United States. States. In the United States, right. But then they exported to third world countries, just like we do with smoking. The, the only bad thing is that people are now drinking all this other stuff. You guys, Lipton tea, Red Bull, so it doesn't really matter. It's still junk. but. But if you look here, they then came up with uh, how we're going to work together <laughs> in terms of health. They're going to have a, cal a beverage that matches your calorie. So if you don't exercise a lot, there's low calorie. If you exercise a lot, you can have regular cola. It became ridiculous. Um, but people are starting to see the connection. And recently, thank goodness, in Berkeley, California, they just won the vote that um, that they will not, ha they're going to tax soda. And it was huge. It's in California. And you can see that they voted to promote the health of their neighbors over the profits of big soda. So this is a start. So in Berkeley now, you're being taxed in California. Okay. Okay. You're talking about sodas, but what about, for example, the orange juice, which is. Well, good, you see, I don't think people are, people sh in my opinion, most people shouldn't be drinking juices at all because it's liquid calories and it's again taking the sugar outside the context of the food. And so men, very few of us have the luxury of being able to drink juices. It's a lot of calories, it doesn't fill you up, and it's terrible for your teeth. So, you know, I don't feel once in a while, you know, having a few ounces of orange juice in the context of a meal is okay. But the main thing with sugar is soda, because soda is, has no nutrition. Orange juice at least has a lot of nu has nutrition, but soda has nothing. If anything, it, it harms your bones, it causes enamel erosion, it causes dental decay, and it just brings you down in terms of your energy. And so, what else is so confusing? And it's confusing here too, you guys have it like we do, is this label. This is the biggest problem, because they can say anything they want and people are so confused and I understand why they are because they just write anything on a label and it, it, so it makes it a healthy product. So look at this, it's a hero, it's a Subway. You have Subway, you know yeah. what it is, right? It was here. Okay, was, well, good, more. good. I'm glad it left. But, <laughs> it I just still have other joke. I know about this. But what about Jared? Look at this. He lost a lot of weight, no? Look at, look at the hammer, look what goes into that sandwich. Would you serve this to your child if you saw that this is what is in? 95 ingredients is in a hero, Subway. Wow. Most of you are a lot of you chemists, scientists, right? You probably use this stuff in your lab. <laughs> so here too, they play with you. Stacy's pita chips. Enriched wheat flour, what does that mean? We want whole wheat. Where's whole wheat? Whole wheat is until here. Look at all this junk. It's called multigrain. And I put this one because this is really interesting. This is now in the Supreme Court. This is a beverage that claimed it has pomegranate juice in it, and it makes you really healthy and all that stuff. And what happened is only 2% of this product has pomegranate juice. Ramoni. Don't you have quid? Quid? What's quid? Quantity of... If you say in the name of the product pomegranate, you have to. It Israel. didn't say it. Year, what it did is it oh, not with certain foods. Like it has a standard of identity. Like mayonnaise has to be a certain percentage. All it said that it can it, it helps nourish your brain, and it has five <laughs> nutrients. This is what it said. 
and it's allowed to because it's, it's not regulated. It's not a drug, it's a food, so you have the FDA and the USDA. It's very complicated. And so look at this, pomegranate juice, 2%. So what happened is is this big pomegranate juice that sued them. And it's going to the Supreme Court, and it's saying that um, it, it, it may win the case. So just to show you politics in action, um, and, you know, this is, I think, really funny. She had to thank you because she just read the ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> so why do people put this on the label? Because it works. Look at the increase of sales when you say that something is natural or when you say that it has calcium added. So these things, you're working food, these things really make a difference. People buy it. In my opinion, there should be nothing on a label. This is not a This is not a medicine. This is a food. Stop talking about. Don't add omega three to foods that aren't naturally rich in omega three. It doesn't make it healthier because Bamba has B vitamins. It doesn't mean anything. It's not any healthier. It's junk masquerade as something nutritious, but it's not, and it's worse. So we have tons of this. But the most important <laughs> thing is government subsidies. If you look at this, this is the government subsidizes the exact foods that cause chronic diseases. And that's why uh, cheap food, the fast food, and all these other foods are so cheap in the States, and thank goodness it's not true here. So here, if you could see that meat and dairy is so heavily subsidized in the state. These are the two food groups I would tell most people to have very little of. Most people shouldn't be eating much meat to begin with in terms of the environment. Also, these are heavy on the environment. And this is what's being heavily subsidized. Why? Because they have big lobbying groups. And they threaten that if you uh, take away that subsidy, you'll lose votes. So here are the subsidies that are the heavily. Corn. What comes from corn? High fructose corn syrup. Corn oil. Cotton. Wheat. Rice. Soybean. Soybean oil. All this are heavily. Where's broccoli? Where's kiwi? Where's apples? Uh-uh. None of that is here, right? So what I did is, right before I came, I went to the supermarket and I said, okay, how much would it be if I bought broccoli, four potatoes, batata sweet potatoes, and four apples? Look how expensive it is. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a lot of money, right? Go to McDonald's, everything here is one dollar. So go to those neighborhoods where people are poorer, less disposable income. What are you choosing when you have a family of four? You're going to buy this or are you going to treat your kids so they feel really special and they're going to have a meal at McDonald's? Why? Because these foods are subsidized and these foods are not. And these foods are what harms the environment, too. Um, I don't know if I have time, so I've really got to go quick. i got two videos I must show. So what have I got? you got my director. Go on. No, I think you can go yeah. on. Do you have yeah, time? Yeah, go on. Yeah. 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 I flew 13 hours to the Continue. Long flight. Continue. All right. Unless you want to pay for me to come back in two weeks. I'll come back any time if you want to do a little donation. Okay, so how did it happen? When I was a kid, I so clearly remember the way we learned about nutrition was we learned there were four food groups. Are you American? Yeah. Oh, you are? Okay. So he's smiling. He's probably he's younger than me, but he remembers. That's what it was. And the first group was the meat, the dairy, the grain, the fruit, and the grains. And that's how we learned. Who knew? That's all. Why? They knew how unhealthy these foods were even back then, but they had the money. The dairy, the dairy and the meat have a lot of money lobbying. This is, these are states that have cattle. These are heavily, um, these are states that have a lot of political uh, clout. And have, so they wanted that people eat more of this. Even though we knew, you know as much as we know now, but we knew these are not the foods we should be eating. And this became something on the side, you know, throwing a vegetable once in a while. This is how I grew up, knowing what to, you know. And then we had the food guy pyramid. We could have a whole lecture on this, how this, but I'm not. But just to show you that at the bottom was grains. Now, it wasn't differentiating between lechem levan or, or um, you know, lechem malay. It was just all pasta, bread, and all of this. And we should eat a lot of this, and then vegetables, and meat, you know, have a lot of servings of meat, and cheese, and dairy, and the top. Use fat sugar sparingly. What does that mean, use fat sugar sparingly? Do you know what it's like to sit and counsel someone and you have to give them that advice? What does that mean? What's sparingly to you or to me? Purposely done, by the way. 
purposely done to make it so difficult for anyone mm -hmm. to understand it and still to allow people to eat a lot of meat and cheese. It wasn't telling you which type of meat or cheese to eat. There's a difference between eating, you know, fatty meat and eating fish. Then the new pyramid. It was a little bit better. In this pyramid, it had it's it had a little bit more showing whole grains and fruits and vegetables and including physical activities. And now, as you know, we have my plate, which I think is better, but still, this is here only because of the dairy industry. They had to put it there because of the lobbying and that they were going to, they threatened, and senators that have dairy states threatened. So this is good, though. It's a representation of what a plate should look like. You should have fruit, grains, and that's it. That's what a portion is. Not you want more, you want more. This is what we should be eating. It fills you up, it has a fiber, and this is what's best for our environment. This is the plate I like, and it's done by Harvard University, because even that my plate gave into the government subsidies. It didn't tell you what kind of dairy, but Harvard University has a big public health nutrition department, and I think they did a much better job. They defined what is a vegetable, not potatoes, not white rice, all of that. That's not what we consider vegetables. We should be really limiting what we eat. They're talking about having some healthy oils. They're talking about drinking water. Limit the amount of milk and dairy you have. Whole grains mostly, not the, a lot of the, the rice, and healthy protein. And they give you examples of this. And to really get away from things like bacon and cold cut and all those other foods. So I like this a lot, but the one I really love is close to Italy is Spain which is the Mediterranean one, which I think is the best. Because here it puts the importance of sitting together with the family, having a meal, being physically active, cooking. That's at the base. And here they have water and tea infusions as your beverages. And here it's fruits and vegetables, olive oil. Here it's olives or spices, herbs, things like that. To me, this is the best pyramid because I think this is more also the foods that are Mediterranean and we should eat where we live and this is more regional foods. So this is my favorite uh, pyramid and once in a while meat and once in a while sweets, um, you know, of course as treats. And then this is one that's put out by Barilla, they have an NGO where they are showing this pyramid of how to eat, but this is a very interesting period because you understand the impact every time you make a decision of what you eat has on the environment. And nothing's greater than eating a lot of animals. That causes probably the most methane gas as it relates to global warming. So if you care about this planet, you'll eat a lot less animals. <coughs> and um, you'll eat more lower chain on the food chain. <coughs> Then we have all the food marketing, and I'm just not going to get into this now because of time, but you know, all the kit things, and you notice the writing, and this is made with real <coughs> fruit juice. I wanted to share with you some stories because I work for Nickelodeon as a consultant, but we don't have time, but it's difficult when business <coughs> and science merge because the interest of industry is to make money. Mm -hmm. That's it. And they will give the public what they want. So if we demand healthier products, they'll give it because they care. And when I wrote the United States of America, I don't know if you know in the opening slide, it was a pun because they care about their stakeholders, their stockholders. So if there is a demand for healthier food, they'll respond, not because necessarily they care about the status of the population, but they care about their profits. So food marketing, and I mean, these numbers are astronomical, how much money is spent on carbonated <laughs> vegetables and how much money is spent on fruit and vegetables. Soda, fruit and vegetables. I don't have to give you the numbers now because there's no time. It works. When you market to kids, there's nothing that works more. Kids can't differentiate. Kids just think that there's kids' foods, that they should be eating those foods. So it's, it's, it works, but does it really? And then here are some other charts, just to show you that billions were spent on food, candy, top market. And here, the, the total budget for all of America for fruits and vegetables, $5 million. Here it was like $98 million, just for candy. <coughs> and this was also, these are individual restaurants. Here, this is $12 billion. And here, to advertise fruit and vegetables, $5 million. That's why. Because the government doesn't promote this, doesn't have the money. These big companies have huge budgets. Yep. Do you know how much Coca-Cola spends? 
uh, does things obviously and it doesn't have it when you had all those Coca-Cola things in this country where you had mm -hmm. the, 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 the sports event oh, North. Yeah, everything mm -hmm. is sponsored by Coca-Cola. It's subliminal, everything, social media, they, they just have so much money and the government doesn't uh, or it's because it's of the politics. Not yeah, the government yeah. pays right. the subsidies right. uh, to make it cheaper and this is why they have so much money. Yeah, I understand, but, 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 she's, but you were saying yourself that it's the, 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 the public will demand. Because people don't do it yet. They slowly do and that's why I said to you that Coca-Cola stock is going down. Slowly, people are, McDonald's too is suffering. <laughs> Go look in Forbes magazine, McDonald's is suffering now. People want to see what they eat. They want to have translucent packaging. They prefer to see what's inside their food. They understand the connection now. They understand what McDonald's, the, the junk McDonald's puts in their food. They're, they're going down by, I think, 30% McDonald's. So what are some of the changes? I got to talk with some positive things. <laughs> we, we're having, we have, which is now, we have calories on all the fast food. In New York City, New York. Does it make a difference? Hard to say. If you really care, you'll look. I once went to LaGuardia Airport. I saw every calorie in all the food. I went on the plane starving. There was no way I was, I was going to spend 1,200 calories. I couldn't find anything less than 1,200 calories. I said, I'll have the stupid peanuts and water. I'll starve. I don't care. It was crazy. How You just don't realize it. And I know this stuff. So could you imagine if you don't know it? So does this make a difference? I think it helps. It helps because people don't any longer connect to food. Um, we now see farmer's markets springing up all over, which is really good, all over. I know you have them a lot here, um, and here you're seeing more menu labeling in other states. So it started in New York, but they're now going to start to men label all their menus and all of the restaurants so that you know how much calories you're eating. Um, the label is changing. The label is so confusing. I barely understand it. How can I expect anyone who doesn't know much about nutrition? The new label hopefully will have the calories per portion, what you really eat. Because people were drinking the soda and they thought, oh, only 100 calories. They didn't realize that was 100 calories, but there are four servings in that. That whole bottle is 400 calories. And now hopefully the new label is going to have how much added sugar is in the product. So hopefully there's going to be changes in the label. And that's because of the Let's Move campaign. The Let's Move campaign was a great, it's only that they took inter the bombers became interested in it only because of a grassroots initiative, not because of big business. It's because they realized the status of, the, of, of kids, of America, and they realized people were paying attention. And there's some major changes. Um, there's major changes in terms of kids who are hungry. They're going to set standards for snacks. I don't have time for this video. I'm going to choose my videos wisely. They also have new snacks that you could serve at schools. So these snacks won't be allowed to be served at schools any longer. For you sitting in this room, you may not think it's a big deal, let me tell you. Working with these schools, knowing that this crap was in the vending machines, it is a big deal. Still, these are not such healthy choices, but it makes a difference. And I think we have to be realistic, too. So these are some of the changes we see. This is from Italy, so, and this is because I don't have time, but I wanted to share with you what's happening in Italy because in Italy there's such a food culture there, and this is in in, in Firenze, and it's a huge food service company in Firenze that provides the food for most of the schools in Florence and all the hospitals, and what they decided is that they really wanted to make a difference in the food that served in children's schools, mm -hmm. so they joined with farmers, and the farmers grow the plants that they serve in food. The foods are really, really healthy. The kids help cook. The kids help serve. And then the kids with their parents take cooking lessons once a week in school because they thought the kids are lo losing that culture. And then this truck appears every day, and it's a wonderful truck. It's a truck that when the parents come to pick up their kids, it has all the recipes of the week, and it has all the foods you can buy to cook together those recipes for the week. And I've been to all the farms in, in, in Firenze and I saw all this in action. I spent a whole day with the kids cooking and they love to cook and one kid was told his, pa his parents that for Christmas he was hoping he could get a pasta maker. <laughs> I find it so, that was his dream. <laughs> you know, and he was like, he's all go, oh, buy me a pasta maker, that's what I want so much. And this truck every day appears and they have the recipes for the week and that's because it's a total loop. 
It's saying that we can't, we got to get parents involved, kids involved, we can't lose the culture. And there's such a food culture in Italy that slowly, you know, they're, they're not food. there yet, slowly. Slow food. Slow food is big too. Slow food, yeah. Slow food. Okay, you have another message there that is appropriate. Right, and it's to buy close. Zero kilometers. Zero kilometers. Yeah. Local. So, local. And it's better to buy local. That's what it says. And yeah. it's all zero kilometers. And the kids learn so much. And you should see, it's the most beautiful circle. If you're in Italy, I want you to come with me. to come with me to see this. They're all coming with me. Yeah, we already agreed about it. This is something I want you to see because I would love something like this to exist in Israel. So, Hagit, this is for you. This is an en a private... Hi, I'm Michael Jacobson. Listen. I'm the executive director of the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Back in 1971, two other scientists and I started CSPI. We came to Washington because we wanted to apply our scientific training to help solve health and environmental problems. We wanted both to improve government policies and corporate practices, to clean up the environment and improve the public's health. We also wanted to encourage scientists to get involved in public interest work is their careers. Now, CSPI has almost a million members, offices in Washington, Ottawa, and Dallas, and we've really been having an impact improving the public's health and environment. Some they people call no us the food money. police because we're the group that blew the whistle on the staggering calorie and fat counts in movie theater popcorn, fettuccine Alfredo, Kung Pao chicken, and other popular restaurant meals. But, you know, we've always thought of ourselves more as food detectives, investigating unsafe food additives, scouring supermarket shelves for deceptive labels, exposing exactly who's paying for the latest study by spotlighting financial conflicts of interest among physicians, researchers, and members of government advisory panels. We're the group that led the fight to put standardized, easy-to-read nutrition facts labels in packaged foods and for federal laws that define organic food, that make common allergens easier to spot on food labels, and that provide health warnings on alcoholic beverages. To prevent food poisoning, we've lobbied for tougher and more frequent ins inspections of food and poultry facilities as well as the farms and factories that supply our produce and packaged foods. Today we're on the front lines trying to improve children's health by getting junk foods out of schools, getting junk food advertising off of children's television. And we're trying to help consumers make healthier choices at chain restaurants by getting calorie counts right up on the menu boards and getting additional nutrition information on the printed menus. In part because of CSPI's efforts, countless food manufacturers are phasing out their use of artificial trans fats, which promote heart disease, in favor of healthier alternative oils. Even restaurants like KFC, which CSPI has sued, and McDonald's have largely gotten rid of trans fat, though there's still much more to do on that front. But we can't do this work alone. CSPI doesn't take a dime from industry or from government, and our Nutrition Action Health Letter does not accept any advertising. It's our members who fund our work and give us clout. If you're not already a subscriber, I invite you to try an introductory subscription to Nutrition Action. So these are the things CSPI, there's one more video you have to watch, so I'm sorry. This is important. This is some of the things they've done, amazing. $10 a year for this amazing, and that's where they're getting all their money and from donors. And you can't imagine the changes that are happening, and they're a watchdog group, and they have no ties with industry, unlike the Amer Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, an organization I belong to, that is totally uh, linked to industry. They have no ties, and that makes a huge difference because you cannot make science and health. You can't, because you get into very sticky situations, in my opinion. Um, and these are some of the accomplishments that they did. It's quite remarkable. I've been a member, and it's they are remarkable. And I speak to them a lot of time with the issues I have with Nickelodeon, by the way. You got to see this this other commercial. This other. Winning. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. This is worth watching. And one more, and then we're done. Don't worry. Uh, what's happening? My IT. 
It's loaded. The New York Times and Bolthouse Farms asked us to create a fictional campaign to rebrand broccoli. The campaign would set out to answer a long overdue question. If advertising can get us to eat something as terrifying as this, could it work to get America to eat its vegetables? Well, we were about to find out. The campaign would start by picking a fight with the ever-popular kale, positioning kale as a fleeting fad and officially ending broccoli's side dish treatment forever. Both the client and the New York Times ate it up. It actually made the cover of the magazine's November 1st issue. And within days, the broccoli love was flowing. Even some of the most influential pop culture icons started showing their support for broccoli. But the buzz wasn't all talk. In November, broccoli sales jumped a whopping 23% compared to that same month the previous year. And in just a few months, the campaign garnered more than 350 million earned PR impressions, the equivalent of $5 million in PR exposure for broccoli. But that was just the start. Three students at Yale University were so inspired by the campaign, they decided that merely reading about it wasn't enough. They made it their mission to make sure the campaign ran. Using Kickstarter, they got consumers to fund all media and printing costs to actually run the campaign in New Haven, Connecticut, one of the country's food deserts. And in the end, their effort not only garnered large amounts of local press for the campaign, including a feature on NPR, it led to some serious results. Just two weeks after the campaign launched in New Haven, one store saw broccoli sales increase 111%. The numbers were undeniable, and so was the passion. In the age of viral videos, the broccoli makeover became a viral campaign. And it's not done spreading. As we speak, consumers are making the campaign happen in all kinds of places, like Ithaca, LA, DC, even Amsterdam. And all thanks to inspired people who saw a fictional campaign and demanded it become nothing short of real. Can we stop with the kale propaganda? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just one, Vega, one second. I just have one more that I... Okay, so there, these are some of the positive changes quickly and then that's it. The positive changes that are happening in the U.S., not to be cynical, I told you a lot of unfortunate things, but I have been working long enough to see this, and things that were extreme, that people were hippies were, are now becoming more mainstream, and that is... There's definitely better food in supermarkets. We see so many more farmers markets, which you have here. The shook is something you have, and you need to make sure that people use it more. More organic food. Organic really does mean organic in the States. It's very hard to get certification. I unfortunately heard that may not be true here. More urban farms. That's becoming so big. Farms in Brooklyn. Farms on roofs. Kids are learning about it. Something you can do here. More young farmers. People are going back to farming. Let's get back to the kibbutz. <laughs> More city composting, better school foods, less soda consumption. It's working. Uh, guidelines are now for food advertising to children on television, which is what I'm working on. More awareness now, even for everyone, about the relationship of what you consume in the environment. People are starting to get the connection. That's because people are more aware of global warming. We see with these horrific storms, there is connection. And it's not just to the elite, the you know, educated. People are starting to understand this. You see people are more concerned about where their food comes. A lot of the new restaurants or fast food in America, you're seeing the guy chop your salad right in front of you. This illusion that you're being taking part in the cooking experience. It's becoming more and more common. People want to see where their foods come from. More information, there's more documentaries, more television shows. We need to do even more here. That's why we have more than a famous uh, television person, because this is where she comes in. Celebrity chefs are big in, in New York, but they're huge here, too. How many times you watch these cooking shows? They need to be a part of this movement. It's been amazing, from J.D. Oliver to all these other big chefs who are concerned about the future and the whole Let's Move campaign. So what do I see? This is just my opinion, and I think it's sometimes good for someone who's sort of an outsider. I'm not 100% an outsider. But to see things that you may not see, that I think are still some wonderful things in Israel. When will you see this thing about Israel? Does it make you feel good? <laughs> Reasons to be optimistic in Israel? OK, so I think the family meal still exists. People still cook. <coughs> maybe dying, but you still cook. And I have one of the best cooks in Israel sitting in the back, my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, high consumption of fruits and vegetables. It is. It's true. Kids eat fruits and vegetables here. They do. 
they still do. When I once asked my husband, why do you think people eat fruits and vegetables here? Because they do. They don't make a big deal, most kids. And he gave me an answer I thought was so, like, so unsophisticated, but it wasn't. Um, he said, because it always existed on the table. It's a part of the meal. And that is so true. It's this basic that part of the meal is the vegetables. It's always there. And kids will eat it because that's their association of food. Fast food is expensive here, unlike the States. That's good. Um, the tipat halav, that's a very important moment where you could teach nutrition education. You have it, or women have it, access to it. Use that as a place to start educating. You have access to medical care here. There are 50 million people in the States that don't have that. That's something unusual to you. That's something that's critical. A small country, there's still a strong connection to the land in Israel. There is. People care. Sometimes people don't understand the association of what they eat, the effect it has on the environment. Um, my husband told me about a campaign here. He remembers when he was a child, the wildflower campaign, if you want to say mm -hmm. it in Hebrew. Does everyone remember that campaign? But he remembers learning about it as a school, as a child, and it made such an impression on him that he should never pick wildflowers. For those too young, but my point being, you got to start young. You have to understand why, if you pick wildflowers, what it does to the country. And I don't give up. I'm sorry, I won't give up. Um, lots of sun here. You have so activity, bones, the weather. You have the Mediterranean potential. You have so many chefs, and now's the time to have a food movement in Israel. This it's is so the good, why it's so bad? What? <laughs> well, it's not so bad. Do you see those? Remember the obesity? You're yeah, not in right. obesity. Talking yet. about the it can be worse. Kind of it can be worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is the last slide I have, and I'm going to cut you in the middle. I, yeah. The last slide I want to tell you about because I think I, I had this huge conference. It was all on the science of flavor, human flavor. And this is from the New York Times. She's talking about how we develop taste and flavor, which is so interesting. So I'm cutting it in the middle, but I'm going to, I really want you to see this. Um, oh, how do I, wait. I need my, okay. Much higher than that. Can we do a little demo, demo on that? Wait, open it. Yeah. Let's open do a little it? demo on it. We have. She's showing two about how sugar threshold. One second. Okay. Much higher than that. Can we do a little demo on that? Than that. Let's do a little demo on it. We have two glasses of water, equal amounts of 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 water, I should say. Eight ounces of water. Eight. Yes. Two cups. What's and, what, and what we have are sugar cubes. So we can do basic research and say, what is the level of sweetness that you most prefer? And on average, for adults... Here we go. I am going to put in my water for adults for the bliss point of sweetness. sweetness. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven sugar cubes, which is uh, happens uh, to be the equivalent of sweetness in my favorite soda well, brand. It's about a 0.35 molar. Anybody that uses a sensory okay. panel yes. is going to get on that bliss point of sweetness for adult. It's not surprising. But when you do basic research and you ask the child, what's the level of sweetness you most prefer? It's... You. Go for it. <laughs> I did seven. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It's a 0.6 molar. And your young teenagers, that's going to be their bliss point as well. You have a biology that's really attracting children. And if you think this is high for sugar, you should see salt. That's <laughs> what they like. Um, so what about the other? Take me over to the produce aisle. So now we're going to talk about the other basic taste, which is bitter. This oral cavity, this your mouth and your brain, is really about to reject poison, to reject that bitter taste is our signal for poison. So you really see this elevated in childhood. And just to give you an example, where you have one sweet receptor, you have 25 bitter. It's really important for us to detect bitter and to reject it. So here's the baby's first taste of broccoli. <laughs> he starts engaging more behaviors. He, but watch, he opens his mouth for that second. 
spoonful, but now it's like... What's that? The hand. Oh my god, and here comes the hand. What's this next one? Oh, no more. So, they, so if this is the bad news, what's the good? I don't think we're ever going to get children to prefer broccoli over candy. Uh, but our biology is not our destiny. We can learn to like flavors, and that begins very, very early. The foods that our mothers eat when she's pregnant and then when she's breastfeeding are transmitted and flavor these first foods. Babies have a sensory system that can detect these flavors and they'll be more accepting of foods that their mothers ate during pregnancy and lactation. Every baby's experience is unique. And every baby is, this is, the baby's getting information about these are the foods that my mom has access to, these are the foods she prefers, uh, these are the foods that she eats. Uh, and this, for the farmers, for the chefs, this is all something that you know. It's not unique to humans. This is how all mammals and even vertebrates learn. The first way we experience flavors are through the diets of our mother transmitting to the yolk of the egg. And then the, if, it, if the egg is fertilized, the chicken will be more accepting of a flavor that had been experienced in that yolk. And what's the best way to teach animals to start foraging on new flavors like sagegrass and sagebrush and the cattle? The best way to do it is you teach the mother to eat those foods and then she teaches the young. It's a simple learning, but it's powerful. In order for the child to learn to like the food, the mother has to eat it. it it's biology is at its simplest, but I think it's biology at its best. And so, uh, I would say that when trying to think for thoughts for food for tomorrow is the one thing what I think with the, what bi uh, as a biologist I would say is that celebrate parenthood, celebrate motherhood. Because being pregnant and then a parent is probably the strongest motivator to change. Witness seatbelt laws, witness the anti-tobacco campaigns. Look at, look at how everyone wants to grab onto a young parent because that's where there's motivation. Celebrate her. And what you're doing now is very timely because the USDA and the, uh, and the Centers for Science are now starting to investigate the evidence because hopefully in 2020 there are going to be dietary guidelines for birth to 24 because everyone realizes that that's how we have to set the stage for healthy eating. And as I would just uh, restate what other speakers had said, food is much more than a source of calories or nutrients. It is a sense of identity to who we are. As a country of immigrants, language is long lost long before our food habits. And when one understands the reward pathways that make us seek out pleasure, these flavor memories that are our oldest memories, the ones that take us to our past, all have their origins in early childhood. And when one looks at the, the biology of the child in preferring higher levels of sweet or salt or really being a, a great poison detector, one realizes that anyone that makes a product for a child is defining the culture into which that child lives. These senses are extremely open to learning, and that learning is beginning long before their first taste of food. So I think that's my message to you, is to celebrate the young parent and celebrate the child, because that's how we're going to get them off to a good start. Well, that's it. I will pause here, too. So thank you. Thank you.